Hi guys, and welcome back to another episode of Indie. In today's episode, we're joined by Professor Avi Leo. Avi is the head of the Galileo Project and founding director of Harvard University's Black Hole Initiative and the former chair of the astronomy department at Harvard University. He is the best-selling author of Extraterrestrial, the first sign of intelligent life beyond Earth, and a co-author of the textbook Life in the Cosmos, both published in 2001. His latest book titled Interstellar is scheduled for publication in 2018. One of my favorite quotes by Abby is, scientific knowledge is an island in an ocean of ignorance. So with all of that, thank you so much, Abby, for joining us and welcome. Thanks for having me. I will be glad to speak about this island. Beautiful, beautiful. So I thought it was just a great way to begin by learning a little bit more about you. What actually got you interested in going on this journey and um, becoming a founding director at Harvard University? I mean, that's quite phenomenal. Well, it all stems back uh, from my childhood. I was born on a farm and uh, was interested in the big questions. Uh, I used to read philosophy books, uh, driving a tractor to the hills of the village. And uh, that's really what I wanted to do. Um, but then uh, since I was born in Israel, I had to serve in the military. And the only option that allowed me intellectual work was to study physics. So I finished the first, uh, second and third uh, degree, a PhD in physics. Uh, at age 24. And at that point, I was offered the, an appointment at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton uh, in astrophysics under the conditions that are switched to astrophysics. And so it was all a forced or arranged uh, marriage. Uh, but then eventually I was uh, offered a, a junior faculty position at Harvard and, and then was tenured uh, a few years later. And uh, then I realized that even though it was an arranged marriage, I'm actually married to my true love because what we do in astrophysics is uh, think about the universe. First of all, it's a great privilege to get paid to think about the universe because you might say, well, it has no implications for our daily lives, but but it does actually, and we will talk about them. So um, uh, thinking about the universe is really a, a philosophical endeavor where you can address really fundamental questions of how everything started, what was there at the beginning, how we came to exist, what is our future. But um, at the same time, you know, I address them, um, even though these are philosophical questions, I address them with scientific tools that I sort of uh, uh, learned over my journey. And then um, so altogether, it puts me in a very uh, unique situation that I'm not like most of my colleagues. You know, I was mostly driven by philosophy, philosophical questions, the big picture, not so much the technical details. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I um, am using science to address those big questions. And uh, so that is fascinating. I would like to also begin with finding out how... Um the formation of life on Earth um, was through one of the theories is panspermia. And so I just wanted to um, ask you that question, if you could touch on that for us. What exactly is panspermia and how would that potentially be possible? Right. So the popular mainstream view is that the, the Earth started with a soup of chemicals. I mean, there was, after the Earth cooled, shortly afterwards, there was liquid water and there was chemistry um in that liquid water that enabled life as we know it so that's the conventional view but there is an alternative for example we know that mars is just uh, 50 percent farther from the sun than the earth is and uh, we know that there was an atmosphere on on mars and uh, so it's a planet with 38 uh, percent of the surface gravity of earth so it's a little weaker in in terms of its self-gravity but it did have an atmosphere to start with and we now know that there was liquid water on the surface based on everything we learned about Mars. So imagine Mars uh, cooling before the Earth and having life before the Earth. Now, it's very easy to dislodge rocks from Mars and bring them to Earth. So there are, we know of uh, meteor impacts that these are asteroids, rocks that collide with a planet like Mars and basically kick out the... Uh, a, a layer uh, from the surface uh, to space. And uh, that uh, these rocks that are kicked into space have a chance of colliding with Earth. And we found Martian rocks on Earth 
Uh, and there is one of them that was uh, studied in the about 20 years ago that uh, people concluded based on the magnetic properties of that rock from Mars that it was never heated to more than 40 degrees Celsius. And that means that if this rock came from Mars with microbes in its belly, you know, that there were tiny astronauts in its belly, living organisms, they could have survived because it, it, it never heated above 40 degrees. And so you can imagine a process by which rocks transfer life, let's say from Mars to Earth, that is a more common occurrence than Earth to Mars because Mars has a weaker surface gravity. So it's easier to lift rocks out of Mars, bring them to Earth. And if life started on Mars, then it could have been um, seeding Earth. We are all Martians. Uh, and that is a possibility that's called panspermia, the transfer of life uh, in a natural way. And you can also imagine an artificial way by which a, a civilization will decide, just like a gardener, you have seeds, you develop seeds, and you decide to plant them in different gardens, you know, in different uh, places. And uh, so in a way, you can imagine directed panspermia, where uh, someone sent a, a craft that carried seeds and uh, planted them on Earth or anywhere else, a habitable planet, um, that where they can grow. Um, so, you know, these are possibilities. We don't know which one is the uh, responsible for life on Earth. And if indeed we came from Mars, then it's really interesting, fascinating that we go back to Mar Mars now. It's just like going back to your childhood home. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the uh, Perseverance rover on Mars is a, a human creation, but at some point Elon Musk wants to go there and even die on Mars. And, and so altogether, going back to Mars, if indeed we all came from Mars, and then uh, it would be like going back home. But uh, the way to tell that is to find life evidence for life on Mars and show that it's identical to the life on Earth. That is so interesting because um, I read a report previously about the xenon on Mars, which was potentially, the xenon, correct me if I'm wrong, is usually found through nuclear explosion. So uh, do you want to talk us through that? How, how would that even, would that even align with what you say? Sounds like. Well, you can have a uh, xenon uh, produced, of course, in astrophysical sources. So by itself, it's not enough to tell us that there may have been artificial life on, on Mars. But um, we can um, uh, imagine a situation that where both Mars and Earth gave birth to multiple babies, multiple civilizations, just like a single mother can have many babies. Uh, we tend to think that we are the first to come on the scene because we don't see anything around us when we go and dig into the ground, we don't find computer terminals from a previous civilization. Um, but that is a narrow-minded view because uh, they could have existed uh, a couple of billion years ago. Uh, er the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago. And uh, just imagine a situation where Mars uh, uh, had an accelerated uh, evolution of life so that the intelligent life developed there uh, at half the time it required on Earth. So instead of 4.6 billion years when we came to exist, it was 2.3 billion years. That's a, just a factor of two. It's not a big deal. And then uh, it, it's interesting because uh, Mars lost its atmosphere uh, somewhere between two and two and a half billion years ago. That's when uh, the low gravity of Mars was unable to keep the atmosphere and then it lost it. We don't know exactly why. But uh, all the oceans evaporated, it became a frozen desert afterwards. And if there was a civilization, technological civilization, then uh, uh, the Martians, you know, would have discussed it extensively. Their politics would be all about what to do uh, when the atmosphere goes away. That would be most of the discussions in the newspapers. And one possibility for them w uh, was to say, uh, uh, look, we have a planet close to us called Earth. Uh, there is not much oxygen in the atmosphere because Earth didn't have oxygen for uh, about uh, somewhere between two and two and a half billion years. Uh, and so they could have said, uh, let's uh, terraform Earth. And indeed, we find that around the time when Mars lost its uh, atmosphere, Earth uh, gained oxygen very suddenly, very abruptly in its atmosphere. Um, it's uh, as a result of cyanobacteria producing this oxygen. But the question is, why did they start producing it so rapidly? And 
you know, we don't know. We don't know the reason why cyanobacteria accelerated the production of oxygen. So suddenly the earth had a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere before that it didn't. And that, of course, enabled us, enabled the complex uh, organisms to, to come to the scene. But it's possible that there were Martians that they terraformed the Earth, they moved here, and, and two billion years later, we can't find any traces for them because uh, of geological mixing, because uh, the Earth was bombarded with a lot of meteors since then. Uh, uh, every square kilometer uh, witnessed uh, about 20 Hiroshima bomb uh, explosions uh, from meteors colliding with the Earth. So uh, it's possible that we don't see their traces just because there was a lot over the past uh, two billion years, and we are not the first. One thing we should keep in mind is that uh, we can use Mars and the Moon. You know, there are ambitions now to go to the Moon and to Mars to establish human bases there. And we can think of them also as archaeological sites. Uh, we can search the surfaces, either for pre-existing technological civilizations or for technological equipment that collided with, uh, with those surfaces over the past few billion years, because there could have been spacecraft from other civilizations that collided, and we, we just need to search. So when you're looking at the life cycle of the sun, so do you think that the life cycle of the sun would also have any potential impact on this. So um, what, what is your understanding of the, the sun's life cycle on, on both Earth and on Mars? Right. So there are two aspects to the evolution of the sun. The sun started uh, about uh, a third fainter than it is right now. Uh, at the beginning of its life, it was fainter. So Earth itself should have frozen. Uh, that's what climate models predict uh, as a result of the fact that once the Earth uh, that there is a lot of ice on the surface of the Earth. Ice is more reflective, so you get even less heat deposited. So you end up with a runaway process by which the Earth becomes frozen. It's called snowball Earth. And the entire surface of the Earth would have, should have been frozen, but we know that it wasn't. We know that there was liquid water, and the question is why. And uh, people um, uh, studied that and suggested that the greenhouse, greenhouse gases that were emitted from uh, volcanoes and other geological events uh, must have kept the Earth under a blanket that warmed it up. And it's, these are basically molecules like uh, carbon monox uh, dioxide and other uh, molecules that ki uh, keep the Earth warmer than it should be, uh, sort of acting like a blanket. A blanket is simply reducing the a heat exchange between an object and the environment. So that's what the blanket does. That's why you feel warmer in the winter when you put a blanket on because the your body loses heat more slowly. And as a result, you keep yourself warm. Uh, and in the same way, the Earth may have had a blanket of those greenhouse gases early on that kept it warm enough to have liquid water. But we know that uh, there were two, at least uh, two instances that, that there, are, there is strong evidence for that. At least two case, uh, two periods when uh, the Earth froze, uh, and it's called Snowball Earth, and that was about six hundred million years ago. And the last one, uh, immediately after it, uh, there was a huge explosion in the number of species on Earth. It's called the Cambrian explosion, and it's quite possible that uh, all the multicellular uh, organisms, in including us, came to exist thanks to the fact that the Earth froze for a while, because then when it melted, uh, nutrients were created that enabled that. Um, uh, for example, algae uh, formed on the surfaces of the melted uh, ice and so forth. And so uh, sometimes when you think there is a catastrophe, like a snowball Earth, it ends up being a fertile ground for an explosion of uh, uh, multicellular organisms that um, led to all the diversity that we have now. So it's actually a blessing in disguise to go through this catastrophe, catastrophic period. So now, and so that's, uh, that's with respect to the beginning. Uh, now, I wanted to say something about the future. Within a billion years, the sun will continue to warm up uh, and uh, heat the earth. And then within a billion years, the earth will be too hot. It will be exactly the opposite situation where uh, the planet would lose its uh, habitability, irrespective of what humans are doing. Irres Global warming is something, you know, that we are doing, but it's, again, producing a blanket that keeps the Earth warmer. But 
what uh, will happen due to the sun is that the excess heat will basically boil off all the oceans. There would be a huge um, a runaway process by which um, we will lose liquid water on the surface of Earth. So, so there is, you know, when you think about the Earth as hospitable for life, it's only through a limited period of time. Uh, and uh, a billion years from now is 20% of the age of the Earth. It's, we have really one-fifth of the history left, and then we have to go to space. Yeah. So from, you on the, from what you're saying, um, what, so climate change is essentially exacerbating a natural phenomenon that's happening anyway. So even if all of us did everything we possibly could to try and help the environment, it's inevitable what is happening. It's a natural cycle of the sun. Right, right. But the sun, you can think of it as a nuclear reactor that is uh, bound by gravity. You know, you have hot gases. It has a high temperature in the middle that burns, that fuses uh, hydrogen atoms. So it's just like uh, a nuclear reactor, except uh, it doesn't have walls. It has gravity that keeps it together. And and this is the kind of nuclear reactors that nature produces. These are stars, okay? And uh, we happen to live near one that uh, allowed us uh, to come to exist, but it's we, we are not wedded to it. You know, we can create our own nuclear reactor and go anywhere we want. Yep. Uh, on a spacecraft, on a space station, you know, we can imagine even building a space station that we will inhabit and then uh, adjust the distance from the sun such that we will feel comfortable. And, you know, we uh, humans 100,000 years ago were in the jungles of Africa. And since then, we, we uh, learned how to live in apartment buildings. So if you think about it, 100,000 years from now, we could learn how to live in space in a completely artificial habitat. It has nothing to do with what nature gave us because we want to mitigate the risks that nature... I mean, nature is sometimes cruel. You know, conditions change and you will perish if you were to surrender to those conditions. But what humans can do is adjust the conditions around us such that we would survive uh, for as long as we can. You know, like in, in principle, indefinitely, if we can provide the heat from our own nuclear reactor, if we can sustain... Um, uh, for example, if we can repair the human body such that it won't last only a century, uh, that's global in principle. We can augment it with artificial intelligence. We can do all kinds of things. Yeah, and actually I've um, been having conversations about that. So um, one of the things is bioelectricity, which I think is just so phenomenal, where your body actually generates its own electrical current. And through that, you can actually look at electrical current of other creatures, such as um, these, these tiny little planarians. So there's these small little creatures called planarians that can last for, for almost indefinitely. And so, um, and also I'm looking at um, a gene modification. So I do see the potential and I do see that we, in my eyes, we are almost on the precipice of, of potentially living forever. And I think when I see like all of these alien potential life forms, which I'd love to talk to you about, I, I, I almost see that a way for us to join them in this exploration of, of the infinite universe is through this life elongation. Um, but I just wanted to also go back when we we're discussing panspermia and how you mentioned we could have potentially originated from Mars. And then you spoke about the snowball effect on Earth. Um, and you mentioned that as the Earth started to cool down, that's what propelled life. But if we originated from potentially Mars, how would that have? So we landed on Earth, um, but then the, all of the information was held within those original um, seeds of life. Um, and you could even use water as, a, as a, an example because water is in almost everything or in everything. Um, but you said that through that hence heating and cooling, it caused life to propel. Would that have already been within our um, DNA or within those building blocks that could have been sent through to Earth? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of evolution here on Earth, but the seeds for that could have started somewhere else, yes. And then, um, you know, uh, but we are just at the beginning of a cosmic journey, as you mentioned, and there are three revolutions that I can see in the coming century. One is uh, already looming on the horizon. It's the artificial intelligence um, revolution where, um, you know, the, we will get to a point where there are sentient uh, artificial intelligence systems. And the, the way I define sentience is that we won't be able to tell the difference between a human and a machine, uh, you know, and it will not be true just for one test uh, by one person, it would be true for billions of, billions of people interacting with those machines for decades. Okay, so at some point there would be no difference. These machines would behave, uh, I mean, would respond to 
anything we send their way in the same way that people do or even better. And so at that point, you know, uh, uh, computers will replace humans on many tasks, including prescribing medicine, including um, uh, uh, providing companionship, you know, to people, especially people that died. You can imagine training an AI system. I would really love that if, if there was an AI system that I would train on my parents that passed away a few years ago, such that uh, when I, I, I could still speak with them through that machine, because if it learns how they, what their guiding principles were and what their uh, general uh, uh, way of thinking was, then it could have imitated that and, and it could have learned from experience and continued to evolve. It's not a static thing. It's not a picture on the wall. And so that's the beauty of an intelligent system. And I would, uh, it would have fulfilled uh, a, a need for me. It would fill a hole in my reality that I lost my parents. And so I can see that happening in the future, that humans that die will be sort of substituted for their love you know, by, by some system that for people who had relationships with them. And, um, and so that would be the first revolution. And eventually those AI systems would also interact with each other without the human intervention. And that would, of course, change everything because they would establish their own communities. And and it would it would raise important ethical questions of whether unplugging an AI system from the wall uh, is equivalent to pulling the trigger on a person. And uh, uh, since both are sentient, it may be the same, uh, um, you know, ethical uh, issue. Uh, but the next uh, revolution that I can see, and you alluded to it, is uh, that the human body could be repaired, and uh, just like those animals that live very long. Perhaps we would live uh, indefinitely un un unless an accident happens that, you know, a, a car runs over you on the street and it, it cannot be repaired anymore. Um, and uh, so that is the second revolution. And the third revolution is that we find that someone else did all of that already. We find a an extraterrestrial civilization that is more intelligent than we are, that is a million or a billion years into our future because we just started. We our science is only a century old and they may have had a million or a billion years. And so that would imply that they already know what we would find. Um, and they already developed that. And in, in, in some sense, that would encapsulate the other two revolutions that we are trying to initiate now. And um, I can imagine all of these three revolutions happening over the coming century. So, you know, this is quite a remarkable time. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a lot to break down in that. Um, so I think in the beginning, you were speaking about how your parents, um, you know, there's a way that you could create a system to kind of talk to them. Um, I, I almost feel like it, it almost, life is like we know, finite for the time being. And, you know, um, if something can simulate your parents, is it really your parents? So that I think you could go into a philosophical notion of like, are you just trying to hold on to something? that, you know, unfortunately has passed as, as hard as that is. So well, so it will not be a simulation. The way to think of it is that it will be just like them in the sense that it's a system that is capable of learning and is adapting to new circumstances. So, you know, we are used to looking at paintings on the wall and these are static uh, depictions of our physical appearance. You know, they're really primitive. If you think about it, why would that be of value to reproduce the way you look? You know, that's completely superficial. And when I go to uh, Harvard Square, I see monuments or paintings of people that thought very highly of themselves and wanted to preserve their physical appearance. But that's really not impressive to me because it's a static image, doesn't really tell you anything in terms of content other than the way the person looked like. And I don't know what the person thought. I don't know how the person would respond to, to the circumstances right now. But with an AI system, you can design uh, a, a system that learns uh, about changing circumstances that reacts to them. And it's sort of like a human being. If, it's, if, if it becomes sentient, then I wouldn't see a qualitative difference between speaking with my parents and, and, and having a system that sort of imitates their uh, guiding principles uh, to me, that would be a very, you know, important addition to the reality I live in. Because I could now the only thing that would not be substituted is, of course, physical contact with a real human being. You know that that is something you can't easily substitute for 
Uh, but uh, the, most of our interactions with each other are emotional, are uh, through conversations, and, and that can be substituted for. Yep. Um, so, okay, you have the, the philosophical debate of if I had to take every single particle of you and I had to copy it over, at what point do you stop becoming you? Or if I had to 3D print you, so I destroy you as you are and 3D print you somewhere else, is that really you? And so okay. I said, well, but that's all with your parents. Like, if you are having this this um, robot that that can copy everything of your parents, but it's not your parents, you know. And even if you take a clone of somebody, it's still not them. It can look like them. It can mimic them. But then, essentially, you're asking, you know, what is them, and and is it more of a a, a lesson to 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 maybe release what you know has passed, um, because it is their physical living being. Right. So first thing to recognize is what makes us human. Okay, that's your question. What makes us human? And the first thing to recognize is that it's not the body. It's not our body because just think about Stephen Hawking. Okay, Stephen Hawking started like all of us. He was a young person capable of doing anything. But then uh, he gradually lost his physical abilities and at the end of his life, he couldn't move a muscle. And he actually visited my home and... Uh, for Passover dinner, and uh, you know he could still speak through a machine that would interpret the motion of his uh, cheekbones, and uh, but he couldn't really move. Um, and so you ask, was he human? And the answer is yes, because you know in the later part of his life he still had affairs. You know, he had a f- an affair with his nurse, and <laughs> uh, so how is it possible? You know, because being human is not about the physical body. Okay, it's it's about the human spirit, about what, as long as you can convey that in some way. And my point is, uh, if you take the limit of Hawking, basically you remove the the body component. You say, okay, that, you know, if a soldier loses a limb in a war, that soldier is not less human. Okay, and if he lose, if the soldier loses two limbs, is he less human? No. If he loses uh, half of his body, is he less human? No. I've seen a person with half of the body and, that person looked more human to me than many other people. And so my point is that you can take off the, the entire body, okay? Just take the limit of Hawking. And, uh, and in that case, what makes a human human is the human spirit. And that can be replicated through a machine. That's my point. Because so we- it's not about physical. It's, it's about, emo- it's about the, the interaction of you with that thing. Yeah, yeah. So you, so you're defining consciousness as the interaction between you and something else. That is what right. is consciousness. Right. Not well, consci- consciousness, I should say, because I had a lot of arguments about it, and people tend to think that it's a, a, a special quality, a special element of nature that is not captured by physics. To me, it's just an emergent phenomenon, and the proof will come from artificial intelligence, because if we can construct uh, computers uh, out of silicon, that can imitate consciousness in the sense that you would not be able to tell whether the system you interact with has consciousness as a human or is it uh, just a machine that pretends to be a human. If you can't tell the difference, then to me, there is no difference, okay? Because it's not, there is nothing to consciousness other than us noticing it through interactions. And if those interactions cannot inform us whether we are dealing with a human, then consciousness is just an emergent phenomenon. It's not. It's an. It's a characteristic of a complex system. So you build a complex enough system, and then it looks as if it's conscious. Okay. So um, I have a question for you then. Um, what at what? Okay. So you've got all of these different animals within the animal kingdom, and even before that, where do you draw the line in terms of where consciousness begins? So is is a tree conscious? A tree doesn't necessarily think we. Do interact with the tree, but we don't, we can't have a com- communication with the tree. Is a tree conscious? Right. Right. So a, co- a consciousness is be- basically being aware to the environment you're in. And the best. Uh, well, the it's per- yeah. So the best um, illustration of, of uh, I mean, the significance of consciousness is the fact that humans, for example, were able to create tools, you know. So they were born into an environment like all the animals, they respond to changing circumstances. If there is a fire, they run away. If someone tries to chase them, they escape. Um, but the next step, which illustrates uh, a higher level of uh, intelligence, is to be able to create tools to basically 
not surrender to what nature gives you for free, but actually recreate the reality that you live in. And if you look at human technologies that we have now, that's the ultimate, you know, that's the culmination of this approach of creating tools. So we started with knives and, you know, other things and, and uh, for hunting and gathering, we created tools and so forth. And uh, for uh, creating fire, you know, we learned how to do that uh, and rather than allow nature to create fire for us. Uh, and then we started cooking and everything else. So, and that allowed our brains to develop and so forth. And now we have, of course, cell phones and computers, and that's a higher level of tools that uh, we are able to create. So that that is a s signature of the fact that we are conscious in the sense that we are we recognize our environment to a point where we say, okay, well, it's not just given, we can re recreate it. Yeah. Uh, and, and you might see traces of that in various animals. You know, obviously, uh, some animals are have a social structure that recognizes uh, their ability to recreate their environment, like bees, for example. Or, um, and um, so I wouldn't rule out that bees have some, some sense of consciousness or chimpanzees or um, have that or, or whales. Or, uh, I, I don't really feel, um, you know, part of this... Um, uh, issue of consciousness is people trying to uh, assign importance to us, to, to ourselves, and feeling uh, sort of superior relative to other parts of uh, reality. And I don't feel the need for that because I, as far as I can tell, when I read the morning newspaper, I, you know, we are not very intelligent. There is a lot of room for improvement. So rather than focus on how we are superior relative to others, I would focus on how we are inferior to what we could have been. You know, we are wasting so much energy and effort on destructive measures. Just to give an example, if you were to take all the military expenses worldwide and invest them in space exploration, then we could have sent a million CubeSats to every star, to 20 stars in our vicinity every year. Okay, so 20 stars every year with a million CubeSats. And then if you continue to do that for a billion years, you fill up all the habitable regions around all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Just one civilization that is deciding to become peaceful and not waste its resources on fighting within itself uh, can fill up the Milky Way galaxy with a million probes per star. And I say, you know, it's possible that someone was smarter than we are and did it already because the age of the Milky Way is 10 billion years. So, And chemical rockets can traverse the entire Mi Milky Way galaxy in half a billion years. Yeah. So this could have happened, and the only way to find out is to look around and see if there was a smarter kid on our block. But we are certainly not the smartest student in the class. That I'm sure of, and uh, I want you know that's one reason I seek intelligence from space. Yeah. Well, I mean, personally, I 100 percent, 100 percent agree that if we all collaborated together, the possibilities of what we can achieve is is truly would be truly phenomenal. Um. But just going back, because I just, I do find this really interesting. It's like when I try to draw the line between what is sentient and what is not, and what is, and I understand that intelligence, particularly for us, is developing these tools and being able to um, modify our environment. But when I look at other creatures, like trees, for example, going back to them, I just find it truly fascinating that they can even share chemicals between one tree and another to notify them that there's there's a virus heading their way or there's danger. So there is communication and, and like, um, uh, was it mushrooms? Mushrooms have this interconnected network that surrounds a multitude, spans a huge uh, 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 area. When you walk on the floor, it's almost like they can all fully communicate. So I also sometimes beg the question of like, yes, our intelligence is phenomenal. No other animal can take us to another planet. No other animal can truly create what we have created. But to sit and marvel firstly at you know what you're saying when you look at the whole galaxy or the whole universe we are really nothing and it, it really humbles you when you spend some time looking at all of the different intelligent life that is uh, even within our planet i truly feel humbled because intelligence can also vary in the sense that you know what what uh, the communication between um mushrooms is is truly truly really phenomenal but it's so vastly different to the way that we actually interact. And when you go back to the idea of panspermia as well, it's like, I mean, it's a, an unusual topic, but like um, the way that mushrooms have evolved is also so variously different to the way that other areas of life have evolved. Um, I just yeah, that's, uh, that, that's definitely true. I completely agree with you that um, 
uh, obviously, um, a lot of uh, organisms recognize that working together, that communicating, uh, gives you a better survival uh, uh, skills. Um, and um, and and so we see that in the jungle when animals go in a herd, and obviously we see it in humans. Uh, but the one thing that makes humans special is if you look at the Earth from a distance, and the, the Orion spacecraft did it recently by going around the moon, and you could see the Earth as a blue marble. Uh, and by the way, in that image, uh, you couldn't tell the uh, border between Ukraine and Russia. <laughs> Even though it, it appeared in the news all the time, uh, from a distance, this is completely irrelevant, I insignificant, even though we are obsessed with that uh, fight over there. Um, and uh, just to show you that changing perspective changes your priorities in some way. But the, the, on the positive side, if you look at Earth, you would notice two things that are quite unusual from a distance. You would notice that uh, there is there are city lights uh, on the night side of Earth. And you can see them from the moon, actually. Wow. Uh, and uh, the second thing you would notice is that every now and then there are rockets flying out of Earth. Now, these facts cannot be explained by knowing the composition of the atmosphere of the Earth. So when astronomers decide, let's spend most of our funds in the future on telescopes that would analyze the composition of atmospheres and tell us whether there is oxygen, methane, water, and so forth as their first priority, uh, in identifying biomarkers. These are molecules indicative of life, uh, looking for their fingerprints in the atmospheres of planets. You know, that really is a very narrow-minded view because uh, knowing that would not allow you to forecast that there would be rockets flying off the surface of the planet, that there would be city lights on the night side of the planet. And in fact, if you were to detect those rockets or if you were to detect the city lights, it would definitely confirm that there is not only life, but there is intelligent life because the environment was modified in a way that it cannot be predicted by physics. You know, the rockets flying off a planet, can you can't put the conditions on Earth into a numerical simulation on a computer and forecast that this will happen as a result because it, ha it involves also the human spirit deciding to do that. And uh, to me, that is something that is not, you know, for physicists, it's not uh, possible for us to to forecast based on the fundamental laws of physics. The Lagrangian of nature is not predicting the behavior of people. There is something missing, uh, and and you know we can talk about it. It's really not fully understood what constitutes free will, the human spirit, and so forth. But it is uh, a, a, a unpredictable by the present uh, knowledge we have, and so and so I think that the it's actually even more exciting for us to search for uh, technological civilizations than to search for primitive life, for microbes. Now, my colleagues would say, well, it's more speculative, it's more risky. And I would say, actually, the signatures of that would be conclusive because the Earth didn't have oxygen in the first half of its life. And uh, if you were to look at a planet like the Earth, you might conclude, oh, there is no oxygen, therefore there is no life. But that's not true. There was a lot of microbial life. So not finding some uh, molecules in the atmosphere doesn't tell you about life uh, necessarily. And also you might create some of these molecules in a natural way without life. But finding technological signatures could be uh, conclusive if you find industrial pollution, if you find uh, city lights, if you find the uh, objects. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that that is very true because you can um, you can see a lot more. No, actually, so on that exact discussion, um, I found, I read the Unidentified Area Phenomena Report by the United States National Intelligence in 2001. Um, and one of the quotes was, some UAP appeared to remain stationary in wind aloft, moving against the wind, maneuvering abruptly. In a small number of cases, military aircraft systems processed radio frequencies, any association with UAP sighting. And I know that you um, are quite familiar with the Amaya Ma. Amaya Ma. Amaya Ma. So I was just curious if you wanted to talk more about that and um, and yeah. even of the sightings that have been around Earth, talking about what those technological findings may be. Right. So I uh, entered the, the subject of objects that are near Earth that could have originated from a technological origin far away. I arrived at this as, uh, from, as an astronomer. And um, 
basically as a result of the fact that in 2017 there was the first report about an object from outside the solar system near Earth. And it was given the name Oumuamua, as you mentioned. It was discovered by a telescope in Hawaii. And the first um, conjecture would be to say, oh, it's a rock similar to all the space rocks that we found within the solar system before, except it came from another star, that's all. But then as time went on, the, the properties of this object appeared to be quite unusual. It was uh, most likely flat in its shape, a very extreme, I mean, very elongated uh, based on the reflection of sunlight. And it was pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force without any cometary evaporation. There was no gas that uh, gave it evaporating from its surface that would give it the, the rocket effect. And um, to me, it illustrated the, the possibility that it's artificial in origin, that it's very thin, uh, sort of like a sail being pushed by reflecting sunlight. And indeed, uh, three years later, there was another object discovered by the same telescope, given the name 2020 SO. It was uh, pushed away by reflecting sunlight, no cometary tail, and then identified by the astronomers as being a rocket booster that was launched in 1966 by humans. And we know that it's artificial uh, because we created it. The question is who created Oumuamua? And then uh, as I um, continued to think about this subject of interstellar objects, uh, we discovered uh, with my student, Amir Siraj, two meteors. Uh, one of them detected back in 2014, January 8th, uh, and the second that discovered the, in Mar on March 8th, uh, 2017, both of them before Oumuamua, and they were both the toughest meteors ever identified among 273 objects. A, a meteor is basically an object colliding with the Earth and then burning up in the atmosphere as a result of the friction with the air. But what was unusual about these is that they were uh, very tough. They only disintegrated in the lower atmosphere of the Earth they were tougher than iron and tougher than all the other space rocks. And the question is whether they were natural out of some uh, origin different from uh, a planetary system like the solar system, or maybe artificial. Maybe they were uh, uh, a spacecraft colliding with Earth that, um, from another planet. And, and so we are planning an expedition. Uh, we got funded and uh, we um, are uh, signing a contract on a boat and uh, uh, we also calculated the location of this uh, meteor explosion near Papua New Guinea, about uh, 100 kilometers away from uh, Manus Island. And we're planning an expedition to scoop the ocean floor, collect the fragments and figure out what they're made of and basically try to infer whether it was this particular meteor was... Uh, natural or artificial in origin, uh, whether it was made of some alloy like stainless steel, for example. So that is the continuation of this, uh, of this story of um, looking at interstellar objects. So I would say from the point of view of an astronomer, that's what brought me to the subject. And then a year ago, uh, the US government, um, the, the director of national intelligence reported about objects they can't identify that, as you say, this, this has a long history of a couple of decades or more, um, where, uh, but now they have hundreds, they have 400 uh, objects that they cannot identify and they established, as a result, the US Congress established a new office in government that will uh, assemble the data and do some research to figure out what, basically try to identify the unidentified. And uh, I established the Galileo project, which is trying to do the same using the scientific method. We have a suite of instruments that monitor the sky in the infrared, in the optical, in the radio, and in audio, trying to in, in, is check whether there is anything else other than natural objects like birds or insects or human-made objects like uh, drones, airplanes, and so forth. And so my hope is that within the coming year or two, we will have data that will tell us if there is anything unusual. By that, I mean the Galileo project, or maybe even the office in government will do some research. And, and NASA established uh, a study that will inform them uh, about uh, whether they should invest funds in such research. So that is ongoing, and I met with that committee, and I will meet again uh, shortly. Uh, so uh, altogether, I think the scientific method is the best way to answer what these objects are and whether they are not human-made or natural. 
So just to rephrase that, you have 400, you found 400 various objects that are not from... Oh, that's that's what the government the government found, yes. Uh, uh, they, should, they reported about it, uh, uh, but we don't... I mean, it's possible that it, it's very likely to be a mixed bag. And the point is that even one being extraterrestrial would change the future of humanity. So it may, you know, we need, just need to go through all of them and make sure that none of them appears to be extremely unusual, that, you know, goes beyond the capabilities of human technologies, is not natural, that it has screws and bolts on it. So what I'm saying is it's sufficient to find what? We don't need more than that. Yeah. And what's your, so you've obviously been speaking to um, a lot of the um, US government and, and military and so on uh, on this conversation. Do you think that there's any scope in them maybe not sharing a lot of information with the general public? Let's say, for instance, they have actually found something that is quite profound. Do you think that it's quite likely that they would keep this a secret or, you know, based on what you say with the 400 objects, they're still trying to decipher what is this? And, and you just mentioned that if one of them was not from Earth and was something very different and, and showed signs of intelligent life, we would all want to know. So right. what do you think about that? Right. So the U.S. government is mostly concerned uh, about the, the national uh, safety of military personnel, national security issues. And uh, they are not a scientific organization. As far, I mean, they are not. Their job title is not to figure out what the universe is made of. I mean, and that's why when one of them told me, "Oh, if we find evidence for an extraterrestrial uh, piece of equipment, the U.S. president will be the first to know," and I said, "That makes little sense because uh, imagine Cecilia Payne Kapashkin. She did the first uh, PhD in astronomy at Harvard University a century ago." And she argued that the surface of the sun is made mostly of hydrogen, based on the analysis of the data. And she was the first to say that. Now, imagine her being asked to inform the president of the United States first, before anyone else knows. That makes little sense. Why would the president care of knowing that the universe, the ordinary matter in the universe is mostly hydrogen? I mean, that's not a matter that doesn't, that information has nothing to do with national pride or national borders, or it's just knowledge that should be shared by all humans. And so I think that this study of uh, extraterrestrial uh, equipment should obviously not adhere to national borders, should be shared with humanity. And that's what the Galileo project is about, um, having the data open and the analysis transparent and uh, shared with everyone. The reason that the U.S. government talks about those objects, unidentified aerial phenomena, is because their day job is to monitor the sky. So they would be the first to notice something unusual. Astronomers are not really looking nearby. Astronomers are mostly focused on distant sources far away. They have a narrow field of view. And if a bird flies above the observatory, the astronomers ignore it. So th there is really nobody else was watching the sky except the government. That's why they would be the first to be intrigued. And it's completely natural for them to be the first to, cr to talk about it. But uh, what is not natural is for them to continue the conversation. Because I think it's scientists who should carry out the interpretation. And uh, and there I find I'm frustrated by the fact that most of the scientific community puts a stigma on it, ignores it. Even the SETI community, this is the community searching for radio signals, uh, is uh, tabooing this subject. And, you know, SETI traditionally is about looking for radio signals. That's just like waiting for a phone call at home. You just wait until you hear a phone call. But um, that you may never get a phone call if um, if nobody is calling you at the time that you're listening. Uh, and um, on the other hand, there is a completely different search method for neighbors, and that is check your mailbox for any packages that may have accumulated over time. And that is a very different method because the sender of the packages may not be alive anymore, but yet the packages accumulate in your mailbox. So, so searching for objects is a, co a complementary approach, and it may be actually the better approach. And the fact that the SETI community has an issue with that, I think, is completely unwarranted. And the fact that the rest of the mainstream uh, astronomy community is uh, ridiculing any discussion on that is also inappropriate, given that the public cares about it uh, and the government cares about it. Yeah. So let's actually, if you want to talk us through a little bit more about the Galileo project, really go in depth into what inspired you um, you've spoken a little bit about what inspired you to start that, you know, really exploring um, life on other planets and, and, and um, 
providing that information. So just talk us through that whole that whole concept. What got you interested in the node, which I think is very quirky, um, and the three branches of activity that are focused around that. Right. So about uh, two years ago, I published my book, Exoterrestrial, and it became a bestseller, was translated to 25 languages. I had about 2,000 interviews as a result in two years. And um, and as a result of that, I, you know, people came to to know me and uh, a, a few uh, multi-billionaires visited the porch of my home dur- during the pandemic and committed funds to my research. And I did not ask for that, but um, then I had the funds and I decided to establish the Galileo project. And uh, within uh, a few months, I had 100 uh, volunteers that... Uh, uh, became members of the project, and uh, since then, uh, a thousand more volunteered, and we are still f- um, uh, filtering them. Um, and then um, the project has three branches. One is to look for objects similar to Oumuamua, uh, the will be the Vera Rubin Observatory. I call it a dating app uh-huh. because we will try to find uh, which object we want to date, uh, dating the next Oumuamua. And that date is very expensive. If you want to send a camera very close to that object in a space mission, it will cost more than a billion dollars. So most of the time we will swipe to the left and then every now and then we'll select an object that we want to date with. And then taking a a close-up photograph is uh, following the the words, um, you know, a a picture is worth a thousand words. And in my case, if I had a photo album of Oumuamua, I would never write the book, Extraterrestrial, it would save me 66,000 words and because just the images will tell you what the object is. Um, so that's, what, uh, that's one branch of the Galileo project that was inspired by the discovery of Oumuamua. And the second is going after um, uh, uh, interstellar objects that collide with Earth. These are the interstellar meteors that I mentioned. And we are planning an expedition to Papua New Guinea within the, uh, a few months where we would try to retrieve the fragments from that object to figure out whether it was artificial or natural. So that's the second branch of Galileo project. And I plan to sleep on the deck of that boat and uh, sacrifice as much as my time is needed to figure out what this object was made of. And uh, I just, uh, over the past few days, together with my student, we worked really hard to figure out the location of that meteor uh, based on um, seismometer data and I just put it on uh, medium the, the the description of uh, I, I write an, a, an essay every few days and this one was about uh, the pleasure of finding out where the meteor was which is along the lines of Richard Feynman that says that, that the biggest pleasure is figuring figuring things out you know like uh, there is something that you see you don't fully understand and then you figure it out and then everything falls into place, which pretty much happened in this case. And it also serves the benefit of us uh, knowing where to go in the treasure hunt of the fragments. You know, that, that's a practical benefit. So then that's the second branch of Galileo. And the, f- the third branch is uh, the one where we go after the unidentified aerial phenomena. So we assemble the um, a, a system of cameras and that... Uh, monitors the sky in the infrared, optical, radio, and audio. And we're basically taking a movie of the sky at all times. And the data is being analyzed by artificial intelligence algorithms. And we just uh, started to get data about a month ago. It took us uh, more than a year to uh, build the observatory. And then we are planning to make uh, several copies of this observatory and place them in different locations. And so within the next uh, year or so, we'd start getting interesting data, analyzing it and reporting it so everyone would know what we see. Brilliant, brilliant. And, uh, you know, when you um, find something, I mean, that would be truly, truly, truly phenomenal. And you, you're you not just doing something for yourself, you're doing something for all of, of mankind, uh, which is just right. absolutely... Yeah, fun. so uh, I, sh- I should say all of this uh, came about because uh, both my parents passed away a few years ago and... Then I realized, you know, we live for such a short time, uh, we better focus on substance because prior to that, I was, most of my activity was driven by trying to impress other people, trying to uh, make them happy. Uh, and uh, or, uh, very often when you do that, you, you go in circles. You basically revisit the same thing again and again that 
you know, everyone else is working on and just introduce nuances and everyone feels it warm and cozy and because you keep discussing the same things without making much progress. Uh, but I said, the hell with it. You know, I have a limited amount of time left and I would just focus on what I think is the most important. And to me, the most important question is, uh, as I said, the, is there a smarter kid on the block and what can we learn from it? Because uh, this would be the biggest revolution that humanity ever witnessed. It would, it would be. And now, you know, I, I, one of the quotes by Stephen Hawking was, um, if aliens visit us, the outcome would be much as when Columbus landed in America, we didn't turn out well for the, it didn't turn out well for the Native Americans. And, um, however, in your last blog, um, with the should we develop an ET encounter manual, you mentioned you're actually not worried about the finding, uh, finding extraterrestrial life due to our relatively young son compared to our visitors. Uh, rather than seeing it as a threat, you noted it should be more of a learning curve. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about that, specifically with the Galileo project. You know, I mean, I just think it all ties in so beautifully. Right. So I disagree with Stephen Hawking on this uh, because I think it's arrogant of us to think that uh, we pose a threat to anyone. Okay. When you think that you're a threat to someone, uh, it means that you're in the same level. But um, we developed our science and technology only over the past century. If you think about it, quantum mechanics was discovered just a hundred years ago. And the all the gadgets that we use to communicate, like the two of us are speaking as a result of the understanding of quantum mechanics, which is a century old. We still don't understand quantum mechanics at a fundamental level. Uh, there, there was a Nobel Prize given for entanglement, which still poses a, a very deep philosophical interpretation issues about quantum mechanics and the reality and so forth. But uh, putting that aside, my point is that this is a tiny fraction of the age of most stars. It's one part in a hundred million. So most likely, you know, another civilization will either be much more primitive than we are or much more advanced than we are because the chance of them being exactly in the same century as we are uh, is very small. And if they are similar to the way we were a million years ago, to find them, we will have to board a ship and land on their planet and start searching through the jungles, through the bushes, trees. That's a lot of work. I don't think we will do that. And a much easier task is for us to imagine a civilization that is far more advanced than we are. Let's say a million years ahead of us or a billion years ahead of us. In that case, all we need to do is look around because they will come to visit us. And uh, that's what I'm thinking about. And, and in that case, it's all about us learning from them. It's not so much that we pose a threat. I mean, they could have eliminated life on Earth a long time ago. I, I think we should be completely relaxed about it. Um, and, uh, and we should just uh, try to find traces of those that are much more intelligent than we are so that we can learn, get a sort of a, a leap in our understanding of what we should uh, aspire to be. Um, sort of like uh, if you have a very smart student in the class, you know, rather than uh, thinking that you pose a threat to that student, you would ask yourself, okay, how can I learn from that student to make myself better? And that is, I think, the best approach. Uh, and uh, in that sense, I'm not afraid at all. I, 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 I would love to learn something from them. And if a spaceship were to land in my backyard, I would uh, hop in. <laughs> well, I, I actually see that when you look at the evolution of, of humans on, um, on Earth, and, and then you try and expand that to the entire galaxy, you, I think that there'd be two ways of doing it. One, we become super peaceful. We all work together. We realize how beautiful life is and how unique it is. And so therefore, when we find life on other planets, we are open to just sharing that empathy. But there's another one to say that through aggression. So if you look at um, specific cultures that have shown a lot of aggression through the years, um, that heightened aggression could mean that they would kill every other human on Earth and therefore they would expand through their aggression onto other planets and therefore they could pose a threat. So it depends on whether they grew through empathy or they grew through aggression. Well, my point, my point is that travel through interstellar space takes a long time, okay? So um, you really have to be patient because even, you know, using chemical rockets to travel to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, takes 50,000 years, okay? So the if you are aggressive, you can't immediately inflict uh, wounds on your uh, opponent uh, over a short period of time. You, you know, it takes a long time to travel and that moderates your level of aggression. But moreover, 
you know, I think we should think about um, uh, the Darwinian principle of the fittest survive. And here, the by the fittest, what I mean is uh, the civilization that is capable of surviving the longest. And uh, if I consider uh, the two possibilities, being aggressive or being collaborative in the spirit of science, uh, I would guess that being collaborative and uh, peace-seeking uh, or, or scientifically oriented allows you to be longer lived uh, because you adapt to changing circumstances. You know, you uh, send more uh, more of copies of what you care about to space. So altogether, I would think that um, uh, science, collaboration, and being wise is a better recipe for long-term survival. And as a result of that, if we find something, it's the, the something that survived the longest because the things that survived for a short time that were extremely aggressive are not around anymore. So just the filter of time and the fin filter of changing circumstances would leave us with the wisest, most intelligent technological civilization. That That's my point of view. And I'm optimistic in that regard. And I think it should motivate us to behave that way. We are not doing it right now. Yeah. Okay. We are behaving in a way that is uh, very narrow-minded. We're wasting a lot of resources and fighting each other. If you look at human history, most of it was shaped by a group of people trying to feel superior relative to other people. And what a waste is that? Because if there is something much more smart than we are, a, a, a smarter kid on the block, then uh, all the small differences among us are completely meaningless. Yeah. And uh, therefore, we should treat each other as equal members of the human species, work together, and, you know, try to move away from this rock that we were born on, you know, go into space. That should be the next frontier. And uh, so I, I'm optimistic. I really hope that for the sake of the survival of humanity, that we will all uh, get a, a, a better sense of what is worthwhile doing rather than you know, fight each other, try to feel superior relative to each other. All of this looks to me like, um, you know, the the, the not so smart uh, kid uh, in in the class trying to show that uh, that that he or she deserves a better status. And this is not really what we should aspire to be. And and moreover, we we should not think that um, we are a threat because we are not behaving very intelligently. We cannot be a threat. We are just not intelligent enough. Yeah, and it's, I find it very interesting when I look at back through history and like um, the, one of the um, civilizations in ancient Greece um, discovered language and writing before so many others. And so there was a dominant um, subsection that were the pre-Spartans that just came in and killed them all because one was more intelligent, but the other one was more aggressive. And that's why I was curious, like, and I, I and I hear your your understanding, and I really do hope um, that when we do meet with extraterrestrials, that they will actually be loving and friendly and um, and open towards us. Yeah, but but if you ask yourself, what was left from these Spartans today? Not much, but from the ancient Greek philosophy, we still learn it in in universities. Yeah, right. That, so uh, so in a way, they lasted longer. Yeah, no, very very valid point. And so when you're talking about meeting with um potentially other uh, life forms, um, when you're looking at the expansion of the universe and the continuous expansion of the universe, um, what exactly does that look like to you? So when I was looking at the, um, the galaxy, you would think that more um, ancient civilization or intelligent life would go towards more clusters where there would be more life rather than us, which are more on the tail end um, of that. And, and through time, that's only going to keep accelerating to the point where we're going to be completely isolated um, and finding other life would be almost impossible. Yeah, so we know that the universe is not only expanding, but its expansion is accelerating. And that is as a result of the vacuum energy, which is called the cosmological constant of dark energy, which um, uh, it's basically producing repulsive gravity that pushes galaxies apart at an ever-increasing speed. And what that means is that galaxies that we can see today, uh, when the universe will age by a factor of 10, will move away from us faster than light. So even light would not be able to bridge the gap between us and them. So if you imagine a friend on such a galaxy uh, sending you text messages, beyond a certain point in the future of that friend, you won't get any, any text message. Just like 
this friend falling into a black hole. So when the friend crosses the horizon of the black hole, at that point in time, you're not getting any new information about the whereabouts of that friend. And so the same thing happens, happens in an accelerating universe, and that's our long-term future. We would be isolated. The, our own galaxy will be surrounded by vacuum. So uh, there are two ways to deal with that. First, um, you know, you could imagine going to places where you will have the most number of friends, and that these are clusters of galaxies, not just our galaxy. So we can still travel to the nearest cluster of galaxies, and there we will have a thousand galaxies instead of just one. So you will have a thousand times more friends. Um, and by the way, the smallest stars like Proxima Centauri, the most common stars that weigh about the tenth of the sun, they last for trillions of years, a thousand times longer than the sun. Wow. So, uh, the, so there would still be stars when the universe will have nothing. There would still be stars shining. Uh, these are the most common stars, like uh, dwarf stars, uh, Proxima Centauri. And uh, in particular, Proxima Centauri has two habitable planets next to it. So you can imagine parking on one of these planets and living there for trillions of years. That's possible. But... Uh, Extragalactic astronomy will not be a profession because you won't be able to see anything except for stars ejected from the Milky Way galaxy. These would be the only things outside of our galaxy. And so um, that is a gloomy forecast for the distant future. Uh, but frankly, uh, as I get older, I, I want to have more space for myself. You know, I, I, I don't like crowded uh, spaces and uh, I enjoy jogging every morning uh, in the company of birds, uh, you know, in nature. And uh, so the, the fact that the future will offer us more space to ourselves um, is a blessing as far as I can tell. Because what is the alternative, if you think about it? The alternative is a universe that is contracting, okay, and uh, instead of expanding. And a universe that is contracting uh, will end up in a big crunch, just like the Big Bang started the expansion, a universe with uh, contracting um, uh, property um, will end up in a high-density singularity, just like the Big Bang, but in the future. Okay, that will be the big crunch. And, and that is claustrophobic as far as I'm concerned because um, it means that um, we have a finite time in our future horizon, and uh, it means that... Um, even though you will see your friends coming back closer to you, that it will only be for a finite amount of time before all of all of us will be crushed into a soup of hot and dense uh, elementary particles. And so that, it, to me, is a much more frightening future. Um, it's claustrophobic to live in a closed universe. We had a 50% chance of being in a closed universe that, con that has a contracting phase to a big crunch and gladly we reside in an expanding universe, the other 50% of the likelihood. And uh, I'm very happy with that. That's, that's just an idea that popped into my head. If the opposite of that is essentially Big Bang, could we have potentially come from the opposite? Yeah, yeah. so there are people... Okay, so the, the fundamental question is what happened before the Big Bang. And mm -hmm. there is uh, there are a number of people that claim maybe there was a big crunch prior to that, and then there was a bounce. So the universe was contracting and then bounced. So that is a scenario that is being entertained. We don't have evidence for that. And because in order to um, uh, figure out if that could have happened, we need a theory that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity. And we don't have it at the moment. And uh, because you are dealing with a contraction to a very high density and then expansion. And Einstein's theory of gravity just predicts a singularity, either a big crunch or a big bang, but these are singularities. These are uh, moments in time when the theory breaks down because the curvature of space-time becomes infinite and the theory doesn't know how to handle it. But we know that if we had a, a quantum description of it, uh, we it would repair the singularity. There wouldn't be a singularity. There would be something finite. And so it's just the shortcoming of um, Einstein's theory of space-time that doesn't allow us to figure out what happened before the Big Bang. And it's possible that what you described is what happened. Uh, I have also another uh, alternative, which is that maybe a, a, a civilization that um, figured out how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, they know how to produce a baby universe in the laboratory. They know how to engineer it. 
And uh, then what you will end up with is our universe coming out of the lab of an advanced civilization. Uh, and then in our universe, civilizations that are able to do the same will create another baby universe. So it's like babies within babies within babies, just like humans are. You know, uh, that the babies grow up, become adults, and make new babies. And the same you can think about cosmology, that the origin of the Big Bang was in a lab where uh, some scientists with uh, white coat uh, produced our universe. And we uh, gave a name to those, uh, we called them God in religious texts, but they are actually scientists. Wow, that's a very interesting, very interesting theory. That brings to mind the um, the theory of the um, one tortoise or turtle on top of another. And it's almost an empty. When except except it's not on top, it's so it's more uh, within. Yeah. So j- just think about it. That I mean, you were born from your parents. Your parents were born from the you know their parents and so forth. And uh, you can go through generations like that. And yeah, uh, I mean, we know that biological systems do it. Maybe the universe does it. Yeah. And the other question I have is in terms of um, black holes. Since you are, are quite the expert in this field. Um, what do you think happens on the other side? And I know that this is all speculative. Okay, firstly, is right. there another side of the black hole or is it essentially just like almost just sucking in and there's just such a dense piece of, of matter that's just being so densely squished that there's just nothing? Right. Just- so so um, uh, once again, this is a singularity. Usually at the se- uh, in- inside the black hole, there is a singularity, which means that Einstein's theory breaks down and we don't know what to do with it, just like with the Big Bang. But um, I was I once had a... A flood at the, a, a, in my basement, and um, a plumber came over, and we uh, realized that uh, uh, some tree roots uh, basically clogged the sewer. Okay, and uh, then it brought me to think. During the hours that we worked with the plumber, I started thinking, "Oh, um, so I usually think that matter goes into a black hole, and the question is, where does it go?" So, in the case of water in my basement, the water goes to a reservoir that the town owns, and it leaves my home, and uh, but in the case of a black hole, is there some reservoir down in the middle of a black hole? And one possibility is that somehow all the matter that falls into a black hole collects in some object at the highest density possible. We call it the Planck density, and maybe that's what happens: that you make sort of like a star in the middle of the black hole, and all the matter that falls into the black hole collects there. That's one possibility. And obviously, we don't know because we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. Another possibility is that it's a portal uh, that leads the matter somewhere else, you know, to another region of space and time. And uh, a wormhole. Sorry. Would that be a wormhole then? Um, yeah, there is a, uh, I guess, a wormhole connecting um, the the inner region of a black hole to another space time. Uh, but uh, we we. We can't tell because we don't have a quantum gravity at our disposal. And um, for, a, for an outside observer that looks at the black hole from a distance, you can't say anything about what happens inside the event horizon because that's basically anything that falls into a black hole stays there and you cannot see it anymore. It's sort of anything that happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> that's the, the motto of a black hole. Or you can think of it as an ultimate uh, prison. You know, it's a, a, a nobody you can check in, but you cannot check out. And so, if when you're looking at opposites, right? If there's such a thing as a black hole, then would be there be such a thing? I know that black is the absence of light, but could you have a white hole? Would there be a possibility? Yeah. So that's uh, in principle possible. Uh, it would be simply. I mean, if you look at Einstein's equations, that they have uh, time reversal symmetry. You can reverse the direction of time, and you get a solution as valid as the other one. And um, so instead of matter falling to make a black hole, you can imagine the time reverse of a version of that, which is matter flowing out of a region of space and time. And that is a white hole. And there is a problem with that because um, the conditions for that are not well defined. You know, where is the matter coming from? And how do you supply all this energy, mass and energy that is flowing out? And so that's why this... um, is ill-posed, and um, the possibility of white holes is not widely discussed. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. We see things in astrophysics. We see uh, sources like quasars, like gamma ray bursts, where energy is flowing out. 
but uh, we associate these with black holes where matter falls in but then gets very hot and and creates those uh, outflows of energy. Uh, but it's possible that some of the objects we are seeing are white holes. We just don't understand it as white holes. Yeah. And uh, at the moment, you know, once again, if we had a theory of quantum gravity, that would make us, uh, that would make it possible to examine the the feasibility of making white holes. As of now, uh, another way to think of a white hole is um, as a naked singularity. Basically, you have a singularity, but it's naked. The energy is flowing out of it. Whereas in the case of a black hole, the singularity of the black hole is dressed up by the event horizons. You can't see it. You can't see anything that happens in it because it can't escape that prism. That's what a black hole is. So you're protected from the sing whatever happens in the singularity. You, are, you don't care about it. Uh, and that's why it's a much more widely accepted concept. And we actually found evidence for black holes. But in the case of a white hole, the singularity is naked. You, you can see it directly. The energy is flowing out of it. And that, that is problematic because we don't know what happens at the singularity. Yeah, that's, that's really, really interesting. And when you're talking about like, so black holes, white holes, all these different uh, polar opposites, I was curious about um, the spin multiplicity. So when you have a top spin and a bottom spin, um, and when you're looking at an electron, does that necessarily, I mean, I know some people speculate that that could be the multiverse theory. So if we have a bottom spin here, then there's another universe that has a top spin. What do you think about all of that? And do you think that, you know, there is almost an infinite amount or not an infinite, but a huge array of different realities happening simultaneously? And if so, like, is there an opportunity for you to maybe jump through or like experience different realities? Because every single outcome and like another one is if you time travel, you are you only time traveling through one reality or, or because you are changing that i don't know what what do you think about all of that right so as much as it sounded as if I, i'm speaking about the fancy stuff but i i prefer to think of myself as someone with the, my feet on the ground in a way because we uh, in physics we have no um uh solutions that allow t time travel that that are credible that you can start from a physical system that will allow you to go back in time. And some, some physicists have conjectured that it's not possible because it would violate co causality, would create all kinds of problems. So, so at the moment, time travel is not something that we have any reason to believe exists. Okay, And you, know, you can organize a party to uh, future time travelers that would come and visit you, and I bet you that nobody would show up. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so <laughs> so that's um, as with respect to time travel. Now, with respect to the multiverse, I have exactly the same problem uh, because um, you know that nobody proposed the way of ruling out this idea. So the only way for us to learn something new, to say that we have new knowledge, is if we uh, had a test of the idea and we could tell whether it's right or wrong. You know, if you can't tell that the idea is wrong, then it could, anything is possible, you know, like, and you are not, even even though, you know, you can live in the, in the metaverse um, by pu putting goggles on your head uh, and uh, you can believe that uh, you live in an environment with all kinds of celebrities, but when you take the goggles off, that's not the reality we all share. So obviously we can believe that the multiverse exists, that everything possible is happening that if you get a D in an exam, then there is a copy of you that gets an A in another part of the multiverse. So it gives you comfort. Uh, to me, it doesn't give any comfort because I don't live in that part and I, and I want to perform well in the part that I live in. And, and I don't know if the other part exists because yeah. we have no way of them. So my point is, if you can't prove it wrong, yeah. then it's worthless. Yeah, because it's worthless in the sense that everything is possible, that it's not real knowledge. Real knowledge is knowledge that could have been wrong. Okay, and uh, so so it, it it became very popular recently. I mean, but the way I see it is as as the same disease of humans uh, wanting to live in a reality that is not real uh, by putting goggles on their head, by taking recreational drugs, yeah. you know, and uh, hallucinating. Okay, you can say, well, that's good for them because they feel better. I say, go ahead, do it. I, I have no issue with that. But you can't claim that this is the reality that we all share. You can feel better about yourself. 
you can uh, take recreational drugs, you can put goggles on the, of the metaverse, you can uh, be a physicist in a reputable university and argue that the multiverse exists and that there are all kinds of other realities out there. That's fine. It's all the same activity of imagining things that you can't rule out. Yeah. Okay. But it's not, it's not the reality that we all share. That's my, my problem with it. I have an interesting thought on the whole um, uh, drugs thing. So we have a specific scope of what we can hear and what we can see. All of our receptors can take in a specific amount of information, right? What is it? What if if you have any sort of um, drug, what happens if it enhances? So we know that with mushrooms and LSD, it actually causes your brain subject to neuroplasticity. You have you, you can actually rewire your brain much faster than than other avenues. What oh, yeah. that does actually widen your way of viewing the world as in you can physically see things. Oh, that's that's the perfectly fine as far as far as I'm concerned. If if you enhance your abilities to function, if you can get a deeper understanding of things as a result of taking some supplements, that that's perfectly fine. Uh, uh, because um, what matters is at the end what you find, okay? And what, once you find it, uh, then, of course, it improves your ability to, to cope with it, to understand reality and, you know, to build tools that adapt to the reality that you understand now. And uh, it's sort of like using tools, you know, like uh, if you use uh, sophisticated tools, they allow you to... Um, recognize or, or identify things that otherwise wouldn't be possible for you to find. And, and that is completely fair and, and fine. That, that is encouraged. So obviously, if you, know, if you drink one glass of wine and as a result, you can get a deeper understanding of some mathematical truths and, some, uh, and, and figure out reality better, then that's, that's, uh, that's perfectly fine. What, but at the end of the day, it's the things that you reveal, the things that you uncover, uh, that matter because then you look at them and either you have something tangible or not. And what I was talking about before is that all these ideas about the multiverse, about uh, these are not tangible in the sense that you can't rule them in or rule them out. But if you do get something tangible, if you realize suddenly something deep about quantum mechanics or as a result of you doing something, that's perfectly fine as far as I was. Mm. And what I always find like what what do you? Also define then, I guess this is where science comes in and I'd love to talk about the advantages of science which you touched on, but like deciphering what is reality and what really isn't. Because once again, we are just a brain within this body that and this body is receiving all of these sensory inputs, you know? And um, when you look at just the way that particles are draft, what tells me that this table is a table? And if you have okay. a dissociative, I'm like, you so, zoom. So, so my definition of uh, understanding reality is your ability to uh, manipulate it. So, for example, let's consider the simple question of whether the Earth moves around the Sun or the Sun moves around the Earth. Okay, and uh, most of humans uh, had the wrong idea uh, for a thousand years after Aristotle. And you would say, okay, well, what is reality? I mean, uh, it's obvious if you put a camera far away from the Earth and the Sun, you would tell that the Earth moves around the Sun. Now, if you have the wrong idea and you're saying, okay, I insist that's the case. I will put Galileo in house arrest. I will cancel him on social media. I would d demonstrate that it's the most popular idea among my friends that the sun moves around the earth. And not only that, but all the other planets move around the earth. And th everyone would accept that. Uh, then I ask you, okay, great. Now let's try and use that idea and let's visit Mars. You know, just visit Mars, send the Perseverance rover. So then you have this idea and you think that Mars moves around the Earth. You will send a spacecraft. It will never reach the destination because your idea is wrong. So that's my point about understanding reality, that once you understand it correctly, you could actually adapt to it. And when you have more friction with that reality, you will realize whether you are right or wrong. So friction is basically looking for evidence and trying to modify things and and then you re so the nice thing about reality is that it's fully consistent that you are going one way uh, to arrive at your conclusions and then you use those conclusions to go at it another way and you see that actually uh, what you concluded let's say from the vantage point of earth just looking at the sun looking at the planets what newton was able to conclude uh, is all from earth but then when you go to space you send a spacecraft with a camera then you look at it from a completely different angle and it's still the same, okay? So that's the beauty of reality, that it is whatever it is. 
and uh, and the the difference between that and and subjective uh, feeling is that you know one person uh, feels one way, another person feels another way, um, and it never is the same, and it never brings you to a, a, a higher level of knowledge. Yeah. So I have a thought on that is what um, the double split experiment. So when you're looking, saying that everything actually behaves as we see it. But when you look at it from what the building blocks of what everything is made out of, it actually didn't act the way that we thought that it acted. And, you know, with quantum computing and all of that, with that um, state of uncertainty, we've developed technology that relies on right. uncertainty right. that don't behave the yeah. way that we That's right. So you need to redefine what you mean by reality. So the quantum reality is different than the classical physics reality we were used to and most of us are still thinking in terms of, but... Uh, in the sense that the quantum reality is probabilistic. You, it's not one outcome or another. You have likelihoods of different outcomes, and you have to live with that. Um, what quantum physics says is that uh, you can never uh, make all of your measurements certain. Uh, if you try to measure the speed of an electron, uh, you will not know its position very well. And if you try to measure its position very well, you won't know its speed. And so there is a limit to how much we can we know, and uh, that's what. So quantum reality is indeed different than the reality we are used to in our daily life. Uh, even though now it's entering our daily life through all the gadgets that we use, uh, but so but it's still a reality. You know, the quantum mechanics still has equations that uh, tell us how systems behave and evolve, and. Uh, in, in, in a way, you have to use those equations to figure out what will happen. And so far, all the experiments confirm uh, those equations. So so even though there is uncertainty, I mean, so one thing you need to give up is in the quantum world, you need to give up on certainty. You cannot know everything for certain, but you can't. You don't have the freedom of everything possible. That's definitely not the case. Uh, there is still a reality. It's just probabilistic. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting because it ties into then once again the framework of science. So when we look at science, you really want to have something that you can test and measure. Um, but I also sort of feel, and and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there has to be a level of open mindedness if you're wanting to broaden our understanding of the world. Because I'm sure, as you know, um, Einstein didn't even think that um, was it even the original findings of the black hole or um, right? Yeah, he made the he made three mistakes. Between 1935 and 1939, he said that black holes do not exist. He said that gravitational waves do not exist. And he also said that quantum mechanics doesn't have spooky action at a distance, which today we call entanglement. Now, the strange thing is that between 2017 and 2022, that in the period of five years, uh, these three assertions, that these three mistakes that Einstein made in, in uh, papers, uh, were all uh, recognized as mistakes because they were uh, they were verified experimentally. I mean, black holes were discovered, the uh, gravitational waves were discovered, and entanglement was discovered experimentally. And there were three Nobel prizes awarded for these three things over the past five years. So it's quite amazing first to recognize that Einstein made all these mistakes two years after he came to Princeton. So that was at, his, at the peak of his uh fame and uh, experience as a physicist he worked from the frontiers and made these three mistakes uh and at the same time these are not trivial mistakes uh in the sense that uh, they led to whole um, each of them led to a branch of physics that um, was rewarded with a nobel prize mm. uh about um 70 years later wow so it really is like looking at um you know because you're saying okay well we we may uh, going to space and we look at the world, um, it, it still is, even though it looks different, it still behaves in the same way. Um, so if you come at, at science with a framework of, okay, it, there, there has to be a, a balance of, of of stepping outside of what most people think is normal, but then still being able to fall back on maths and say, okay, how can I explain this? Because then you're right, everyone will just have random ideas that there's nothing to actually relate to. So do you reckon that there does have to be that balance between some people pushing the frontiers and Others may say, oh, that's crazy. How dare you think that? Um, but if you can oh, actually... Definitely. Yeah. I think that's uh, that's definitely... the That should be the dynamic. And I think um, um, right now in academia, 
the mainstream is too conservative. And uh, the reason for that is that experts uh, get their self-esteem out of uh, subscribing to past knowledge. That's how they got their reputation. So they try to explain anything that comes along with past knowledge, and they try to encourage young students and postdocs to basically uh, create an echo chamber where they repeat their mantras again and again. And unfortunately, that is suppressing innovation. It uh, blocks um, uh, risk-taking. Uh, young people, if they want to get a job, they are worried about uh, deviating from the beaten path. And I think that's a mistake on, on, on behalf of the way that the funding and reward system is organized in academia. I think we should encourage young people to take risks because if you look historically, that's how we discovered everything that we, we use right now. And, um, and I personally had this experience with interstellar objects that uh, the mainstream was um, basically pushing back against this being uh, potentially technological in origin. And, um, and I see no reason for such a negativity. Uh, I think it should encourage us to continue to get more data. And uh, of course, people say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, but I argue that extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. And if it's a self-fulfilling prophecy to say that there is no extraordinary evidence because you're not funding it and you're suppressing it and you're ridiculing it and young people are looking at it and saying, why should I do it? if uh, it will reduce my chances of getting jobs. And do you think that also um, by corporations funding research to better their own profitability, do you think that that also plays a huge role in the direction in which um, our academia is being faced with, rather than doing something well, that is groundbreaking and potentially a little unusual, it's also being funded by what would be make the most profit? Yeah, that's within the corporations, but there is still a lot of wealth in the private sector. And I would argue that uh, the private sector plays a, a, an important role in funding innovation. So, in fact, that's to counterbalance all these committees that are populated by mainstream scientists that are continuing to follow the beaten path. Um, the existence of private sector funding allows for, some, for more innovation. Uh, so I see it as a positive thing. It's sort of like, if you go back to the... Uh, you know, several centuries back, um, there were uh, very wealthy individuals that funded art, and uh, and in this in the, uh, during the Renaissance and so forth. And uh, today, uh, yeah, these are the uh, wealthy people who value science and uh, therefore invest in innovation. And I, I benefited from uh, some of those in in the Galileo project. Wow! And what do you think um, when you're looking at the um direction that science can go in in terms of the future. What do you think are the main key areas that we should be focusing on? Obviously, you are, are focusing on space and the Galileo project is truly phenomenal. What other areas um, do you foresee or are currently being explored that you would, if you had a lot more money, that you could choose to finance? Yeah. So I would say the most important uh, frontier is indeed the search for intelligence, because as I said, it could be a huge revolution and uh, would affect the future of humanity. So uh, that would be my first priority. Then, of course, related to that is just um, exploring space, going to space, uh, establishing human bases on uh, maybe the moon, Mars, or, or exploring those territories, going to other bodies within the solar system, searching for life on them, like, for example, the moons Enceladus and Europa or Titan. Uh, these are very different um, from Earth. They have a frozen surface, but they there is liquid water under the surface and we can look for life there. Um, so exploration, uh, search for life, but most importantly, search for intelligent life. That would be my first priority. And then the second priority is trying to promote our understanding of uh, quantum gravity. I, I talked about those uh, singularities that exist, we know, inside a black hole or the Big Bang. And if, you know, it would be worthwhile thinking about how to advance um, our knowledge uh, in terms of experiments that would probe quantum gravity. And that is not being done much. Now, there are, of course, those frontiers that are well recognized, like what is most of the matter in the universe? We know it's dark matter. We call it dark matter. We don't know what it is. It doesn't interact with light. And, um, you know, that already is a frontier that is heavily funded and not much came out of it in terms of identifying the nature of dark matter over the past 50 years. So I don't know how much 
And I, I don't know how relevant it is to people's lives. But what I would emphasize uh, is artificial intelligence because they can help us in, do, in doing better science. So if we develop AI scientists, AI astronauts, everything AI would be really able to advance you, our knowledge. And uh, so, so exploration of space, number one, AI, number two, uh, you know, or, or quantum gravity in the context of the physical reality. Uh, and then um, the third one uh, is uh, enhancing the longevity of, of humans, basically repairing the human body. I would put a high priority on that so that, um, because this could again revolutionize society. And of course, you know, there are all these uh, uh, things that people talk about all the time, how to mitigate climate change, how to help um, people in poor countries, how, how to improve human health. But I'm really talking about changes that would be qualitatively new. It's not improvement on pre-existing conditions that, we are, that are familiar for, uh, to us from previous years. And, uh, it's, it's a completely different ball game. If we extend the human life well beyond one century to a thousand years, for example, it's completely different work. If we uh, find evidence for an extraterrestrial civilization that is smarter than us and realize that technologies we've never heard about, that is a completely different board game. So, and and of course, AI systems smarter than us that can advance our knowledge is again a completely different board game. So, I'm very much rooting for those, uh, and uh, it's not obvious at all whether the, everyone else is thinking the same way. Do you think that um, there would be potential risks associated? And I understand everything has risks. I understand that, you know, there's a double sword for a lot of things. But with the advancements of AI, do you think there could be a possibility that um, that could actually destroy humanity, where you could create something that's more intelligent that, than us, and they think, well, what's the point of having these mere apes that are just literally just there? Let's just build them. <laughs> right. So we can always build into the system the ability to turn it off. But then is it really sentient? Is it really as intelligent as... Oh, yeah. Because uh, you can think of, I mean, even humans that are definitely sentient, uh, you can pull the trigger and, uh, and, and, and stop their life, right? So in the same way, we can stop the life of a sentient computer by unplugging it from the wall. But, uh, you can always build that into the system. But then wouldn't that make us still have control, like have full power? Like if, if there are more intelligent than us, and they could say, hang on a second, these mere apes could turn off the machine. Why don't I just override that? Or is this just what if... Oh, well, yeah, but you can build it into the um, into the hardware such that it will always be possible to get into a building and press the off button. I do believe that ideas are merging uh, previous ideas together to create something new, have a new insight through um, various merging things together. So with AI, with an abundance of information, could merge things together that we never even thought were possible. And if you look yeah. at technology is advancing, imagine what it could advance, how the, the speed at which technology could propel if we had intelligent light or intelligent... Uh, yeah, that there is definitely a risk. And then my view when I speak to people from the humanities is um, if you go to university, you, you, you see the, that, you know, philosophy classes are still focused on ancient Greeks. That makes very little sense to me. Instead of focusing on what people thought thousands of years ago, we should deal with the questions that you're asking about uh, what the future is like with AI and how to build into the uh, future society, how to build the ethical values that we care about. And that, you know, so there is a lot of work to be done by philosophers, ethicists, psychologists uh, on how to shape uh, our future society. Instead of being obsessed with what the ancient Greeks were saying, we should think about the future. And I just don't understand why the humanities are not realizing it, because obviously there are fewer students now that go to the humanities, given all the hype about uh, high tech and so forth. And um, I would think this would be the remedy to re resurrecting the humanities, basically thinking about how to humanize our technological future. Mm -hmm. I do find personally, I mean, I, I've enjoyed the wisdom of. Um... I like uh, a lot of the Stoicism, Marcus Aurelius and um, uh, Socrates and so on. And I, I find that that allows you to build a good building block. It like sets a solid foundation in the way that you view the world because even though they were written so long ago, there's still value in that they can actually help you deal with specific situations and then 
What oh, that? yeah, def- definitely. But but we should build something new out of it because uh, the future is very different than the past. That's my point, that we have to wake up to the new reality and shape it so that it's safe, so that it's more ethical and so forth. And, and what you find with the social media is really a situation where it grew out of, uh, you know, unexpectedly grew out uh, in an uncontrolled fashion and caused a lot of damage to society, to young people, you know. And uh, it just shows you that without the proper thought, if you just let technology rule the day uh, without uh, supervision, uh, there is a big risk here. Yes. And, and uh, that's why I think, uh, even though Marcus Aurelio said the wise things, uh, he didn't live uh, with uh, with uh, Facebook or, or, or with Twitter or with uh, Instagram. And if you were to put Marcus Aurelius with Instagram, the question is, what is the what would he say? And that's what we should figure out, you know. <laughs> very, very wise. Very wise. And, um, you know, obviously this being a podcast, I would just really love to know um, if you had one message to share with the world, what would that be? Uh, maintain your curiosity. It's not about you. Uh, so we should always be humble and uh, start from uh, humility and with a f- uh, a basically a blank canvas every morning. Just try to learn more uh, rather than uh, build our pride on, on past ac- accomplishments and uh, arrogantly view ourselves as the center of the world and so forth because that happened to be wrong so many times. And so, you know, there is really a lot of joy just learning new things and uh, watching around and without prejudice, you know, and and, uh, working together with other people and not in conflict. So this is my lesson. Um, And I I very much hope we can all stay young because the way I define young is uh, being curious and uh, willing to learn from the unexpected, not assuming that you know the answer in advance. Avi, I think that is such, such wisdom. And I am beyond grateful for you to have this discussion with me today because I have such a curious mind and I've really allowed to explore every domain without prejudice and seeing, okay, what does work and, and then building frameworks around that to say, okay, how does this stack up to everything else? Um, and, and I just, I love your whole idea of the world and I love your whole idea of science and um, you really doing so much for humanity with the Galileo Project. So I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much, Alexei. It was a real pleasure.